Number 10, Aphrodite and Lemnos. Kicking off this list, we have some pretty tame punishments. Definitely cruel to say the least, but more on the non-lethal side of things, as God's sakes go. Apparently the gods love to be praised. Yeah, they're uh, awesome. <laughs> But sometimes they do some foul stuff. The goddess of beauty herself, Aphrodite, gets pretty pissed when she's not obsessed over. And the women of the Isle of Lemnos were kind of slacking on the prayer department. So she cursed the people of the island with a foul smell. I mean, that's pretty mean. Everybody stinks sometimes in life. You know, it's life. Little Musk never hurt anybody. But apparently the stink was so bad, all their partners left them and they were quite upset, Bruh. which I can understand. It was probably just the equivalent to like the great stink in Europe, you know? Bodies and carcasses on a hot, grease day just heating up the water and stinking it up. Ew. But nope, now it's a curse. Poor women of Lemnos probably get that rep for a while, you know? Stereotypes, they're brutal. I don't like them. Also, a little salt water under the armpits, Boom, easy fix. Number nine, Demeter and Ascalophus. Demeter, goddess of harvest and agriculture, and her hatred for a certain mortal man. A, a king, actually. Demeter apparently was out looking for her abducted daughter, Persephone, and was thirsty from running around, naturally. She found a cottage owned by a little old lady named Hecuba, asking to wet her whistle and started drinking some barley juice. Thirsty as all Poseidon, she was chugging from all the running around. The son of the woman, just a little kid, basically was like, Thirsty much? <laughs> yeah, you don't mock a god, little man. She threw her drink in his face and turned him immediately into a spotted newt. <laughs> You're done. You're done. <laughs> okay, couple things here. Little excessive, I think. I mean, <laughs> what do I know? I guess you shouldn't talk shit, kid, you know? Talk shit, get turned into a newt. That's the saying, isn't it? Number eight, Demeter and Erisithen. Erisithen of Thessaly ordered all of the trees of the sacred grove of Demeter to be cut down. Yeah, that's a big mistake right there. Industrial logging. One huge oak was covered with beautiful wreaths, a symbol of every prayer Demeter had ever granted, and so the men refused to cut it down. Every other one, of course, yeah, let's go get that rustic log cabin look. Erisithen needed more wood, so he himself grabbed an axe and went out and cut down that last tree. He was cursed by a nymph, naturally, whose prayer had been heard by Demeter herself. Long story short, she was like, you wanna build and eat? No problem. Gave him the munchies of a lifetime. Non-stop hunger, an insatiable hunger. Guy ate everything in sight. He was so hungry, Guy started eating himself. Yeah, all of him. Look, I've been hungry and picked something off the floor, five second rule, no problem but I've never garlic and buttered my own fingers. But uh, greed is greed, firm but fair. Number seven, Sisyphus and Hades. Sisyphus was the first king of Ephra, a cruel king. He killed guests and travelers in his palace, which was a violation of guest obligations, which fell under Zeus's domain, thus angering him. He took pleasure in these killings because they allowed him to maintain his iron fist rule. Zeus was really pissed, yeah. This guy was cocky, and he punished him for cheating death twice. But his younger brother, Hades, caught wind of this and was like, no, 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 no. As a punishment for this trickery, Hades made Sisyphus roll a huge boulder endlessly up a steep hill, forever. Yeah, he was like, no, 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 Zeus, I got this one. Brothers helping brothers. Hades then displayed his own cleverness by enchanting the boulder to rolling away from Sisyphus right before he reached the top, resulting in an eternity of getting jacked quads and hammies and an eternity of uselessly, effortlessly, and unending frustration. Yeah, that's really annoying. Number six, Hera and Io. Okay, so we're moving away from kind of firm but fair and non-lethals to a little bit more and more cruel. Io was a beautiful woman to whom Zeus fell in love with, a married man. Ugh. Io was the daughter of Inachus, one of the river gods and king of Argos. She was living in Argos when Hera learned about this secret relationship. And she was a little hurt. I mean, who wouldn't be? Stewing in her sinister revenge, Hera turned Io into a cow to keep her away from her husband. You know, pretty non-lethal. Very mean, but you know, fair. After being cheated on again by the same woman, she was like, all right, I guess that didn't work. And Hera was like, I'm done. She then sent a giant gadfly to sting Io continuously in cow form until she ran away, mad cow style, wandering from country to country, always being stung. Okay, I get this. You wanna stop hanging around my man? You get stung every time, okay? Yeah, Bye bye <laughs> Number five, Hera and Heracles. 
Bless my soul, Herc was on a roll, and Hera the Queen of Gods was extremely jealous of that. All those other women in her husband's life, Zeus's consorts, and Hera hated the kids that came along with the adultery. One of them being, of course, Heracles. Who puts the glad in gladiator? Hercules. Yeah, that's the same dude. I was a 90s kid. As the story goes, Hera caused Hercules so much trouble that he was actually driven mad on one occasion. According to Homer, just before Hercules was born, Zeus announced a prophecy that would make Hercules the ruler of the heavens in his place when the time came. Hera didn't like that so much. She kind of pushed the birth thing a little bit. Hera also made Herc crazy. A little bit of roid rage, you know? In a blind rage one night, he kills his wife and son under the rage spell of Hera. Part of this punishment was that the insanity was just temporary, so when he came to and realized that he John Wicked everyone, yeah, she had won. In sadness, he smashed about 12 labors and got himself back on track. Talk about zero to hero. Number four, Arachne and Athena. Okay, so a little hex here, a little labors there. The wrath of the gods is pretty tame so far. Well, was. And then there's the story of Arachne. Ovid recounts the very talented mortal Arachne, daughter of Idmon, challenged Athena, goddess of wisdom and crafts, to a weaving contest. Yeah, you don't challenge the goats to what make them great, you know? When Athena could find no flaws or errors in the tapestry, she was pretty pissed. When Athena saw that Arachne had not only insulted the gods in what she had drawn, but done so with a work far more beautiful than Athena's own art, she was enraged. She ripped Arachne's work to shreds, and terrified of what comes next, Arachne took her own life. Athena brought her back to life, cursing her after a little sprinkle of Hecate's herb, an ancient poison. Arachne's hair started falling out, and then her nose fell off, and then her fingers, as her whole body started slowly turning into a giant spider. Uh? And this is apparently now why we have spiders. Yeah, thanks to this epic weave off. Number three. Hera and Lamia. Lamia was a beautiful Libyan queen and enter Zeus stage right. Of course, loved by Zeus. Yeah, basically through no fault of her own, she got the wrath of Hera upon herself. This dude's commitment skills leads these people to get in a line of fire with some nasty curses. Hera cursed this lady hard. Every time she gave birth to a child, Hera either murdered it or made her eat it, regardless if it was Zeus's or not. Hera was like, Nah, never again. Now eat it. All of them. Even babies that weren't hers. Basically every night Lamia would ravenously make her way village to village eating mother's babies. That's horrible. She swore to bereave all mothers of their children just as she had been once by Hera. Trying to help of course, Zeus gave her removable eyes so that she was blind but harmless in the day. But after she popped those bad boys in, feeding time. Hera's mean man. Number two. Poseidon and Pasiphae. Okay, so we're getting a little bit more into like disturbing graphic land with some of the more cruel things here. What started out as a rumor that some people were kind of smelly is turning into like eternities of pain and suffering and stuff. Pasiphae was a queen of Crete and often regarded as the goddess of witchcraft and sorcery. The daughter of Helios and the ocean nymph Perse, Pasiphae is notable as the mother of the Minotaur. You'll see why. She conceived the Minotaur after mating with the Cretan bull. Minos was required to sacrifice the fairest bull to Poseidon each year. One year, Minos, king, refused to sacrifice his most beautiful strong bull and sacrificed an inferior weak bull instead. Dude, don't with the gods. As punishment, of course, Poseidon then cursed his wife Pasiphae to fall head over heels obsession lust for this beautiful giant prized bull. And many months later, Pasiphae gave birth to a half human half bull creature famously known as the Minotaur. The curse was sent out as a reminder to her husband Minos, quality over quantity kind of deal. That's heartbreaking. For her, of course. Her husband's cheap, so she has to birth a bull. It's not really fair, I'd say. And coming in at number one, Prometheus and Zeus. And our number one spot, of course, must go to the god of gods himself. He can be pretty shady. Cheating on all his lovers, fighting with his old man and his kids. He's a little unpredictable at times. This one, ramping up the cruelty, we have Prometheus. He was our guy. This demigod loved us and stole fire for us. He fought on our behalf. He led the titans into a trap, securing power amongst the gods again. He was everybody's friend, besides Zeus. Yeah, Zeus didn't like the tricks and the new plans and all the attention he was getting. So Zeus punished Prometheus by chaining the titan god to a rock with the might of Zeus himself. And then, worst part of course, having an eagle day in and day out just eat his insides 
out. Basically just slowly eating him for eternity. He would heal overnight, but then come the AM, breakfast again for eternity. Okay, so a little humanity never hurt anybody except for poor Prometheus. Thank you for the wonderful campfires. We now have s'mores, they taste great. But Hercules is coming, buddy. He's gonna come save you. I've seen the last chapter, no spoilers alert. Starting our list off at number 10, trial by elephants. Yeah, we'll start with animals. You know what, I love animals, why not? First of all, I'm not sure if you've ever seen an elephant in real life before, but these things are mightier than you can ever imagine. They're gorgeous animals, but they're incredibly dangerous to be near. Their foot is like, it's massive, it's like a huge tree stump, it's insane. For this punishment, we have to head to a place, of course, where elephants can be found. That's probably a promising start. South and Southeast Asia. Elephants have been trained for years to trample the accused. Now, depending on which elephant you get in this horrible, horrible demise, they were trained to either get the job done fast or slow. Yeah, imagine an elephant getting the job done quickly. Sounds like something you'd never want to witness for yourself, right? Wrong. No, these punishments were all public. It was almost like a show, like ancient Romans Colosseum. We think of that and we think of lions and we're like, wow, that must have been terrifying. Yeah, imagine that, but now it's an elephant with a big floppy nose too, really loud. They're loud, that's a scary way to go. But at least that's a quick way to go, unlike this next one here. Number nine, drawing and quartering. You know you're screwed when there's an and, drawing and quartering. Wait, there's more. This is one of the most infamous methods of punishments. Now, this punishment was first doled out in England back in the 13th century. Now, the accused was, of course, as you'd guess, drawn or tied to a horse and then dwelt, dragged to the gallows. And then at that point, they would usually be hanged, maybe disemboweled, maybe beheaded, maybe be withered. I don't know, other words that start with B, that's pretty horrible. Afterwards, the guilty was, of course, as you guessed, quartered. In other words, he had his body split into different parts, you know. Some, sometimes each limb would be tied to a different horse and then have them run in different directions. It was creative, if I'm being honest, a little bit creative. The choreography, the timing here, it was impeccable. This punishment was reserved for those guilty of treason and was thankfully abolished back in 1867. So no more horses involved, poor animals. Number eight, strapado. Strapado sounds like an Italian artist. It's for sure not, it's definitely not an artist, no. It's creative, again, I'll admit, but in the worst ways. It's an uncomfortable form of punishment, unlike others on this list, it doesn't necessarily always end in death. In Strapado, the guilty is strung up by their wrists behind their head. Now, at first, this doesn't sound too bad, but, Again, just wait. The awkward angle is pretty much guaranteed to cause dislocation of the shoulders. But if that doesn't really kill you, weights may be added. And then at that point, your body's not gonna recover. Thought to have originated in medieval times, of course, always medieval times, could have guessed that one. During the Inquisition, Trapado has been used, sadly, into the 21st century. I don't know what they do in UFC, but there's probably a little bit Strapado going on there. A little arm bar Strapado? No, no thanks. Number seven, heel hauling. As somebody who's not a fan of water, this type of punishment I can't even imagine. I wouldn't even get on the boat to begin with. Already scary. It sounds like something from Game of Thrones and it can vary depending on how bad the ocean or the boat is. Imagine that as a lead up. Yeah, the ocean looks pretty rough today. Maybe you'll make it. This punishment was reserved, of course, for sailors. Sailors at sea couple of naughty mateys. Now, it was first performed by the Dutch Navy back in the late 16th century, and what would happen was, while well, the accused, they would be tied with a rope and then dragged underwater from one end of a ship all the way to the other, around the rudder, around all that bad shit down there. And while many died, obviously, being flossed around a pirate ship covered in barnacles, it wasn't always fatal, if you can believe that. Not always, but a good amount of time, definitely. Yeah, you're not coming back from that. I can't even hold my breath for that long, no way. Number six, molten metal. I don't have to explain this one. This is, you've seen Game of Thrones. This is the worst. This should have been number one, maybe. I don't know, I'm guessing myself right now. This skin crawling punishment was a form of capital punishment because, well, yeah, there's no way you're gonna bounce back from this. While gruesome, this punishment has a fairly simple explanation. They would just pour molten metal or something extremely hot and not great down the accused throat. I'll, I'll tell you what, that's that's probably gonna do the trick. At least it's gonna be fast, right? In Game of Thrones, it was pretty fast. There was like three minutes left in the episode. Guy did it, boom, roll credits. That's fine, that's a good way to go. Beats elephants, in my humble opinion. Usually during this punishment, they would do things to ensure that your throat would stay open during the pouring of the hot, hot metal. And to that, I have to ask, does that even matter at this point? Put on my face, my back, my feet, either way, I'm fainting and I'm not waking up. Sounds like that show, Uh-Oh, from the 90s. Just dumping things. I don't want anything dumped on me. Milk, molten metal, rats, nothing. Number five, sawing. Yeah, sawing. You know, again, another one I don't have to explain too much here, hopefully. Mostly seen in Rome, Spain, and some portions of Asia. 
it's common. It's a pretty common, straightforward idea. Sawing is, you can imagine this one already, right? We sure hope you can because, well, we can't show it. Of course. This is another straightforward one, unfortunately. Capital punishment at its cruelest. Getting sawed in half. Again, to the public. Yeah, here's a fun one. Here's a fun show. Drive-in movies or sawing? I'm not sure. Here's a fact that some folk don't quite realize. This one sends shivers down my spine. But sometimes the sawing was done from top to bottom, not side to side. It's almost impressive, right? It's like cutting a carrot in half vertically. It's a little awkward. It's rolling around a bit. But you know what? They did it, somehow through bones and your soul. Mozzatello, occasionally used by the papal states for only some of the most, you know, terrible crimes or crimes that were considered bad at the time. Basically, the person who was being taken care of, they would be led to a scaffold that was located again in the public square, classic. Everyone come on out, grab your family, your aunts, your uncles, we're watching something today, classic. This person would be accompanied by a priest and on the scaffold would lie a coffin. How fitting, a coffin and of course, a masked executioner who is dressed in all black with the zipper mouth probably, I don't know. A prayer would be said for the soul of the condemned, because I mean, sure, everyone's watching, like, oh yes, of course. And then when that time came, the executioner would swing a mallet into the air and then bring it down on the head of the prisoner. Now, sometimes, and hopefully this one blow would be enough to take their lives, and sometimes it would just render them unconscious, which would then lead them to their throat being, you know, you get it. None of these sound great, but this one, it sucks really bad. It's like, hey, you're gonna get hit, and then it might get worse, I don't know. Necklacing. I'm never wearing my necklace ever again. Here we go. Necklacing is a terrifying practice that involves a rubber tire, not a necklace, a rubber tire, and unfortunately, it involves a human being as well. The rubber tire is filled with petrol, which is then put around the victim's chest and arms, and they can't move, and then after that, they are set ablaze. Yeah, you figured that was coming. You think I'm talking about the hills have eyes or something terrible, but no, this was real life. I mean, I'm sure you can figure out what happens next, but this method, sadly, can take up to 20 minutes for somebody to pass away from. Little different than the elephant stuff, you know what I mean? They're just left suffering the whole entire time. This one wasn't too public. Nobody could stick around for this one. Cause you know, 20 minutes, no way. I could barely get through a 10 minute YouTube video. You wanna watch this guy burn for 20 minutes? Good joke, how horrible. Impalement. This was another one that was highly requested by you guys. I've heard you comment on this a couple times. So yeah, I'll talk about it. Sure, you weirdos. Impaling, do impaling, long neck, impaling. I'm like, you got it. I hear you, I see you, let's make it happen. Vlad the Third, also known as Vlad the Impaler or something like that. He liked doing a little bit of something like this. This was a popular form of punishment for a very long time, sadly, and was most commonly used as a response to crimes against the state. Although Mr. Vlad, we just mentioned, basically did it to every Everybody that he didn't like, so I suppose to each their own. Sure. All right, Vlad the Third. Maybe Vlad the Fourth won't do that. Let's hope. Impalement was a method of both torture and obviously execution that involved, well, just slowly driving a stake or a pole or a spear or a big carrot, something pointy or whatever, through a person in order to completely or partially. Um, perforate their torso. There we go, I sound like a Victorian scientist. You can impale somebody vertically or again, horizontally, if you wanna spice it up. Instead of going this way, you go, oh, that's really bad. Ducking stools. Medieval times, here we go. If you can do math, you're going for a swim. This was a punishment used in the 16th and 17th century in England and New England. And it was uh, usually a punishment that was reserved for women. Women who uh, could do bed mass. There you go, you're a witch. Have a, have a nice dip. This punishment was given to a woman for doing what was considered unwomanly things. Back then, whatever that was supposed to mean. And it was ridiculous. Apparently this included things like having an argument with their husband, taking a dip, fighting with the neighbors, you're going for a swim, gossiping and backstabbing, how dare thee, you're going swimming. Whoever made these rules clearly had never met a man or a friend because newsflash, everyone does all those things. I did all those before I even came in here to film, so hopefully I don't get dunked in the river. But basically this punishment would see a woman being tied up to a stool and then dropped into a lake or stream over and over again while a bunch of dudes with no teeth watched and they're like, yeah, that's what you get for being smart. And Talking back with your opinions on International Women's Day. We're posting this one too, eh? How ironic is that? Kicking off the list at number 10, boiling. Whenever I get in a bath that's too hot, I think of the medieval times. I can't help it. I can't believe this was once a real thing. I get chills thinking about it. Either water or oil would be used for this ancient punishment. To die by being boiled, that was reserved for those who poisoned others. So if you have any vials of poison, toss it. Don't do it, man, trust me. In 1531, the time King Henry VIII was running the show, they made boiling a capital punishment. So poisoning somebody back then was equal to treason. Therefore, it was agreed you should be boiled slowly in front of 
of like a room full of people. I would say that's the worst, but I know what's also to come on this list. Number nine, water. Taking a step away from the worst physical thing one could possibly go through, let's take a look at how far the mind will go before it too breaks. Sensory deprivation is still around today. In fact, there's many who pay for it. Yeah, they lie in a dark tub full of salt, then they float and listen to Childish Gambino. It's a magical experience. Your senses are powerful, especially combined with water. So this dripping machine, this old water punishment, that was just all bad. You had ice cold water dripping on your forehead and your face over and over for hours and hours. Drops would be at different random time so you can predict it as well. My toes are wiggling while I'm talking about this. This is making me anxious right now. In medieval times, they would tie you down and then using a horn, a big ass funnel, they would pour nine pints of water down into your, down your, down your throat. So water is horrible in many ways. Number eight, fire. Can't talk about medieval punishments without mentioning this witchy classic. Commonly practiced in Babylonia and ancient Israel, then later on in Europe with the classic witch hunts, burning at the stake didn't come from churches, like many believe. They didn't call the shots there at all. That was mainly how small towns settled local beef. Yeah, by burning at the stake, instead of just like a fist fight at the park. Burning at the stake came in full swing way back in 1431 in France. French disbelievers like Joan of Arc, they were burned at the stake. It was crazy that they actually did this as a form of punishment. This is one of the worst medieval punishments. And believe me, there's a little bit of a silver lining here. It was quicker than most. Sometimes. Gunpowder was sometimes used so that the burning and stuff would be much faster and brighter and louder and much more horrible. A lot worse on paper, but a lot faster. So honestly, I think it's better. History is insane. Another red hot punishment used in medieval times was when the accused had to hold a red hot iron bar and then walk a few steps with it. A red hot iron bar, your hands were literally toast at that point. Here's where it gets even worse though. Three days later, the accused would come back to the court and then when the bandages were removed, if their hands were healing, they started to heal, they were deemed innocent. They were on the path to goodness and whatever. If their hands were still in horrible condition from say, I don't know, holding a red hot iron bar, then they were pronounced guilty. That's how the courts worked back then. Number seven, the rack. On to something not so hot and fast, but rather dull and slow, the rack is surprisingly well known. It was originally introduced to the Tower of London around 1420. The Duke of Exeter referred to this device as his daughter. What a weirdo. It's like guys who call their car like she. It's like, okay, just a little bit too close to your automobile, man. Relax. It was an open bed frame type device where your ankles were tied at the bottom and your hands were tied at the top. Already we're off to a horrible start. It was horizontal as well and sometimes it was up. It was, it was all bad. It would just leave you hanging by these ropes and these ropes were slowly tightened more and more, obviously causing some problems to muscles and joints that were, you know, holding things in place. This was done to extract information. This is also one of the worst things I've heard. Even getting tickled like this would be horrible. I couldn't even imagine. I make jokes because I'm uncomfortable, honestly. Hit that thumbs up to spread some good vibes because we're not even halfway done, folks. Number six, molten metal. This was another form of cow capital punishment, and if you've seen Game of Thrones, it'll ring a familiar bell. A few of these do, actually, yikes. Metal would be heated up in a cauldron for a long, long time to the point where it was liquid, it was molten metal, just a soup of minerals. Look, we said this video wasn't for the faint-hearted, and here at Bumblebee, we like to keep that promise. They would then pour the molten metal on your head, or more commonly known, this would they pour it down the throat of the accused. Obviously, it wasn't done as a method to extract information, it was done to brutally end someone's life. Because they're not talking after that, of course. Execution by molten metal was supposedly done to a wealthy Roman general, Marcus Licinius Crassus, back in ancient times. The metal would burn your muscles and skin, literally cooking it, and then after a few moments, it would harden. Bad, bad, not good. Number five keel hauling. Not to be confused with kegels, keel hauling was reserved for the worst of the worst at sea. This was used by pirates for sailors who disobeyed orders and all that jazz. The victim would be suspended by a rope with rocks or weights around their ankles, then they're lowered to the keel of the ship where all the sharp barnacles live. After so long, these ships are so old, it's just piled on layers and layers of barnacles. Then they would get dragged all along them with the water and everything. Water plus pain, it's a lot. It's a deadly combination. Anything to do with barnacles in the sea, no chance. I'll literally tell you anything, Blackbeard. Anything. Number four, solitary confinement. 
This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society, but it can truly be one of the worst punishments out there because of the type of psychological distress that it causes. We were all just in a pandemic for so long. We got so bored and we had Netflix and iPads and I whatevers. I can't even imagine this back in the day. Basically, it's a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no contact with anybody else. Not even like a guard or anything rattling keys like in the old times. It was just nothing. No one would even check on them. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long they forget about their families. And some people have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they just forget how to speak, really. They forget how to be a human and interact in the real world. Solitary confinement and the negative effects that it has on a person is becoming a wider topic of conversation because of the effects on a person's mental well-being, and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was literally just a room made of stones. It was pitch black, freezing cold, you were tucked away below some janky castle, and most of the time you weren't really alone. In the dark, nibbling away at your little piggies were, number three, rats. Another Game of Thrones classic. If you're a rat person, I know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their pet rat. That's cool, but maybe cover Stuart Little's eyes for this one. Rats as a medieval punishment, where do I even start? Okay, this one was a punishment for the rats at the same time. What was once called a rat trap involved a man or woman being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped down to their chest or their stomach. Now inside this metal enclosure, there's rats, which are also just loose walking around and the person can feel them, the little feet walking around in their skin. And this is when the person instilling the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure Historically, it was hot coals that were usually placed on top or there's a fire underneath, which quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside. From there, the rats begin frantically searching for a way out, but because it's made of metal and they can't bite through that, they find your skin and then that they can obviously bite through. So you can paint the picture in your head. It's disgusting. Number two, the breaking wheel. The breaking wheel is literally just a large disc, a pirate ship wheel almost just lying there where somebody is then tied to it and everybody else just hammers them and beats the out of them over and over. But of course, since we're talking about medieval times, everything has to be a show and whatnot. So once the accused was beaten and then presumed dead, the wheel would lift up and turn just to show everybody what's up. Another way to use the breaking wheel, yep, there was more than one, again, creative folks back then, they would tie a person to the wheel and then continue to rotate it and then all the ropes below would get tighter and tighter and twist. Kind of like the rack, but with a literal twist. And finally coming in at number one, the brazen bull. This one takes the rat's problem and then makes it a you problem. Out of all the ones on this list, the brazen bull is the last one that I would do straight up haunting. It's also been referred to as a Sicilian bull and basically it's not too complex. There is a bronze sculpture often in the shape of, you guessed it, a bull. But in medieval times, it was just a big closed cauldron and usually it was large enough to fit a person inside. Yeah, this was in a Saw movie too, I believe. That's how you know it's a good one when it's in the movie Saw. So once the person was locked inside or it was leaned over so they couldn't get out, a fire would then be set underneath this bull and then you can probably figure out the rest in your head. They would even engineer the bull so that when somebody screamed, it sounded like a bull's roar. How fun is that? How fun is history? I'm learning so much about history that's fun on Bumblebee, and I hope you are too. Number 10 is got your nose and your ears and a couple other limbs because ancient civilization globally shared the unique agreement in the removal of someone's nose, ears, or both as the punishment for a crime. Tokugawa era Japan is no different. While flogging was a common penalty for crimes such as thefts, fighting, public intoxication, etc., amputation of the nose or ears or both replaced flogging as a penalty very early in this time, which it didn't last. This period of Japan follows a particularly violent one, and in the time of Tokugawa, they repealed a lot and calmed a lot of the criminal punishment laws from before. Regardless, commit the crime and pay the fine with mutilation. People who experienced this punishment were socially marked for their crime and were banished from hiding it. No big deal for those who had already been punished with exile in accompaniment of mutilation of their nose and ears. Female culprits of crimes that were punishable with mutilation, however, were never mutilated, but they were ordered to parade through the village naked, so I mean pick your poison. Speaking of a woman having to pick her poison, number 9 is the tobacco ordeal. This is one of the most fascinating trial and ordeal ordeals that I have come across in my time researching. While there isn't much information, what little there is is unique to say the least. So a woman who has committed a crime goes through trial and ordeal the way that a man would, but often has different and less visceral ordeals. A favorite way was the tobacco ordeal. A woman would be made to smoke several pipes full of tobacco 
and the ash of the pipe was to be put into a cup of water as she did. No ash was to be spilled anywhere but the cup. This water and ash combo would be mixed together by a finger or spoon and once the woman has finished her appointed number of pipes, she would have to drink the full cup of water. It was believed any woman who could smoke the tobacco and drink the ash water without feeling sick or dizzy was an innocent woman. Anyone who could not was guilty. Guilty of being a normal person because who is drinking out of an ash cup and not feeling like death after? But anyways. Number 8 is the world's uncoolest face tat. Your parents could be disappointed about that face tat you chose, but imagine how much more disappointed they would have been if it was a government issued one smack dab in the center of your forehead. Tattooing in Japan can be traced back to 14,000 BC to 300 AD, when they were believed to hold a mystical significance. Afterwards, the culture moved away from tattoos well until the Edo period, where it came back in a very different way. For some duration of the time, a stamp like forehead tattoo was the go to punishment for a non violent offender, like a thief, a loiterer, a vandal, whatever. It was classified as a type of corporal punishment like flogging was. Now, usually it came with expulsion, which unlike exile doesn't kick you from the whole town, but it can kick you from your previous neighborhood. It was a fantastic record keeping tab, however, as the tattoos were chosen by each region and was unique to them, making criminals from other areas identifiable. In most societies, if a tattooed criminal re offended, they did receive the death penalty. However, some of the civilizations had three strikes, then you're out system. In 1745, tattooing replaced the previously discussed facial mutilation as society became gentler and less bloodthirsty. This continued over the years with face tattooing changing to the less embarrassing and quite fashionable by today's standards, arm tattoo. In 1872, the newly established government of Japan abolished the tattoo penalty for once and all. Let's get uncomfortable with number 7, the steak ordeal. This fun ordeal starts with two large vertical stakes driven into the ground on one of Tokugawa's three execution grounds. There would be multiple sets of these stakes depending on the height and weight of accused facing the stakes. This is because the body was to be stretched taunt between the two stakes tied by the wrist and the ankle joints. They start with the wrist to, sus to suspend the body and make it easier to tie the ankles, but once the victim was up on those stakes, their weight was all on them. Anyone tied up in this torturous fashion was forced to remain this way until they either confessed or, well, died somehow. Hanging by the hair of the head was another staking ordeal. Obviously this wasn't something doable for someone without long hair, but worry not as long hair was cultivated between both sexes so there was never any shortage of torture options. While held aloft by two others, someone would tie the victim's long hair into a knot at the top of the stake frame. So once they're tied, they let the weight of the person all hang from that hair until they confessed or something uncomfortable to imagine happens. So number 6 is going to make me even more nauseous, it's tendon cutting. This makes me very squeamish, I'm gonna go fast. A customary punishment before and during the Edo was to cut the Achilles tendon of both feet. This was to maim a person for the rest of their life. No hunting, no working, heck it couldn't walk in most cases, and you lost muscle connectivity that even aided in hip motion. This punishment makes you depend solely on others for the necessity of life. Seeing as this was usually a punishment for manslaughter or a passion killing, your family would have very likely disowned you anyways, leaving you alone to figure this out. One documented account is of an old man who had to move his body by dragging his legs using his hands and carrying two small blocks of wood in each to protect them as he did. If your tendons were spared, it was only to be exiled from your home and city forever or to be executed. Anatsurushi is number 5. The Japanese were incredibly determined to keep Christian colonialists out of their nation. They represented imperialism and they were known to be dangerous outsiders, bringing foreign diseases and unnecessary wars in politics. Essentially, they didn't come quite Quietly, they came quite noisily and bossily, and the Japanese just weren't feeling that. Now, the method they chose actually turned out to be incredibly effective and withheld Christianity from the country for far longer than many others had. This is because it was a wildly brutal method. Anatsurushi was used in the 17th century to coerce Christians to recant their faith after entering Japan. Victims would be hung upside down, suspended by their feet, and often lowered into a hole, itself often filled with excrement at the bottom. A cut would be made in the forehead or around the temple area in order to let the blood pressure decrease in the area around their head. The aim was to break their resolve, to renounce their faith, or they would eventually die. For this reason, one of their hands would be left free and exposed so they may signal upwards a willingness to recant. Both Japanese and Western Christians are known to have been submitted to this torture. Sometimes there was a doctor around just to resuscitate them so they can continue being tortured. They were also subjected to head down crucifixion and water crucifixion. Water style was carried out by putting an upside down cross at the shoreline low enough that the tide 
tide at low tide and waiting for the tide to rise so that the person would eventually drown. Christians were treated this way until 1873 when Christianity was finally allowed into Japan. And since we're already on the topic, number four is crucifixion. While it's unclear when crucifixion was introduced into Japan, likely 12th to 16th century, it had already had a 2,000 year history when that when they did. So the Japanese added some of their own twists to it, as you heard previously with the mention of an upside down or a water crucifixion. It was one of the three executions reserved for the worst of offenders, alongside beheading and hanging. Sometimes the three punishments would be mixed and matched. For example, crimes against individuals of higher social status and against family members or one's master could result in beheading prior to crucifixion. Adultery, theft, and subterfuge are all crucible offenses as they threatened both the social and political order. The person to be crucified would be carried out on horseback nude, a lot adding to the humiliation of their sentence. He'd be poked and prodded with staffs by the assigned guards who would also carry a large banner with the person's name, offense, and punishment. Oh yeah, they aired your dirty laundry on the march to your grave. This route would also be set to pass the accused residence as well as the location of their crime scene. The accused was then tied at the execution site and when the cross was risen and mounted with the accused tied upon it, the guards used their staffs to spear him repeatedly until a final thrust to the throat for a ending blow. The boiling point is number three. Large cauldrons were used by the Japanese for boiling fish to retrieve oil, preparing rice, soups, and cooking people alive. This particular torture was a remnant of the warring states period that I've mentioned to come before Tokugawa. They were completely masochismic in that time period. The Tokugawa empire saw that and ended quite a few of these punishments because of it. But not at first. This is why I can tell you how the Tokugawa would fill these jumbo sized cauldrons with cold water and put it over over a blazing fire. As the water began to warm, the accused would be told hop on in. What starts as an arguably nice toasty bath begins to boil. The accused is to remain in hot water until they confessed. Now this was only used as an ordeal when the judge and jury were very convinced of a person's guilt, but the person just wasn't fessing up. It could sometimes also constitute as a mode of punishment or execution. For example, an entire family in the 16th century were boiled alive in a gigantic bathtub as a punishment for a failed assassination. Another fun ordeal was using a pan of boiling water and having the accused dip their arm into it. If they refused to do it, they were assumed guilty. If they didn't got burned, they were also assumed guilty. Only if you could stick your arm in boiling water and come out unscathed are you innocent, because that makes sense. Number two, we pull the saw, or don't. Don't will sound better in a second. So like a few others on this list, the Tokugawa's let this torturous execution method from the past dynasty enter into theirs. However, they made some changes in the brutality of it. But before this change, this execution method allowed for an interactive experience. So step right up boys and girls, who is twisted enough to slowly saw at the head of a man buried alive? In a book by Louis Freud regarding Japanese history, he describes the grisly execution of a samurai slash bounty hunter. The man had attempted to claim a bounty target, but missed his shot. While he had escaped, it wasn't for long. He was captured and identified, and he was sentenced to the pulling the saw. The man had been buried up to his neck, and a saw set up next to him, with the signboard inviting passerbys to cut at his neck, slowly hacking the men's head off alive. Now traditionally this saw is also placed close enough to the victim's throat that the accused, while buried alive, could make the decision to speed up the process if they really wanted to. But like I said, changes were made. Metal saws, they were replaced with bamboo ones, and rather than being used to actually saw off the living's heads as they once were, they were now simply put on public display next to the condemned person for periods of days prior to their execution by other means. And number one is the painful honor seppuku, which literally translates means self disembowelment. So before I unpack that statement, there are two forms of this execution, voluntary and obligatory. Voluntary is pretty rare. Circumstances such as warriors defeated in battle awaiting execution by their enemies and not wanting the dishonor of that. Meanwhile, obligatory seppuku refers to the method of capital punishment for samurai to spare them the disgrace of being beheaded by a common executioner. This form of execution was ritualized as a result. Great emphasis is put on the proper performance of the ritual. It's to be carried out in the presence of one or more witnesses sent by an authority who had had 
issued the execution. While kneeling, the samurai would take a small dagger or short sword from a small table placed before him. The proper method, developed over several centuries, was plunging this weapon into your left abdomen, drawing the blade up laterally to the right, and then turning it upwards. A truly exemplary samurai would then remove the blade and push it into his sternum across the first cut and then up to pierce the throat. This is a brutally painful and extremely slow death to experience. Weirdly, for this twisted reason, it was favored by the warrior code used by the samurai as an effective way to demonstrate the courage, self control, and strong resolve of the samurai and to prove the sincerity of purpose even when facing their own crimes. Women of the samurai class also committed ritual takings of lives, but instead of slicing the abdomen, they slashed their throat with a short sword or dagger. A little easier on the girlies, I guess. Kicking off our list at number 10, stealing. Stealing today, okay, I mean, it depends what you take, and most of the time, your family doesn't end up abandoning you in the woods, right? I mean, hopefully, right? The Vikings, they didn't play around. Materials were sparse back then. It was hard to replace stolen goods. And the deed of stealing back in the Viking age had severe consequences. The Vikings believed that if you stole, you were a coward. Yeah, and I kind of agree. My bike got stolen twice growing up. Cowards? Both of them. Maybe it was the same guy. I don't know. Stealing was a different kind of low to Vikings, and I'm sure many of you can see eye to eye with this. But when you steal from somebody, they don't have a chance to defend themselves, right? There's no honor. There's no battle for land. No fight for property. No bout for glory. It's just a shameless act, right? Raiding and stealing were two very different concepts in the Viking age, because you're probably asking yourself, wait, didn't the Vikings do that horrible stuff where they stole everyone's land? They did, but it was different, apparently. They viewed both differently, although they sound the same in terms of brutality, and someone's losing their home regardless. A stealer would be abandoned from the clan, pushing them out into the woods for around 20 years. Yeah, all because you stole a pine nut. Way to go, Eric the Dumb. Get out of here. Number nine, rodeo. Hold on to your butts for this next one. This one I did not expect, honestly. If you were an early medieval Norseman and somebody insulted your wife, first of all, how dare you? Second of all, the legal punishment afterwards it can vary, but one of the most bizarre ways to settle your beef, pun intended, was by involving a cow. Yeah, a cow. He came in, he was brought into an area, hopefully a controlled area of sorts, and that's where its tail was shaved and then covered in grease. Poor thing, had nothing to do with any of this, and now he's over here. The man's shoes were also heavily greased, and the cow was prodded to make it upset, right? Sounds like something Johnny Knoxville would do for fun, but it was not fun at all. The rodeo began when the man pulled on the cow's tail, like a bell being rung. Like, here we go, gong, and then he just got whipped away. Now this, of course, would upset the cow, and it would thrash him about. Now if the man, at this point, can keep hold of the cow's tail for a specified length of time, why, he passed the test, of course, so then he was allowed to live on, and he had to keep the cow afterwards. What a weird bonding story, imagine that. Number eight, taking lives. Yeah, what happens when you do the worst of the worst? I mean, today we dish out quite the punishment, you even get a Netflix special or something like that, but back then, somebody in the Viking age? Well, it kind of wasn't a big deal. I know it sounds horrible to say, but hear me out. Back then, as long as the convicted were open and honest about the whole situation, like say, I don't know, if somebody had challenged him to a duel, why then it's fair game. One specific case from history involved a Viking man catching his wife in bed with another Viking. Not good. You don't want to catch your wife in bed with anyone, let alone a Viking. That's game over. His feet are hanging off your bed. You're like, oh, he's so large. No. That Viking man at that point could kill the fella in bed, but he had to bring that bloody sheet to Viking court. That would have to provide as evidence to show what happened and where and why. You know what I mean? That's simple. Today, there'd be a few more steps involved in that case, obviously. But the Viking age, this case was closed. That's it. They're like, okay, Viking law is done. Go home. Someone go raid a village. Number seven, hot-headed. All right, here's the deal. We're doing a list on Viking punishments, so as we go on, yeah, we're gonna get darker and darker with our content. For example, one method of punishment in the later Viking age also happened to spread alongside Scandinavia's conversion to Christianity. So there are some thoughts and some actions, some questionable thoughts and actions going on in history. And this punishment was referred to as an ordeal by fire. This would involve the accused undergoing some painful exposure to 
heat. Maybe you drown in flames, maybe you have to eat some sort of fire or flame situation. I don't know, either way, it was all terrible and it was very, very hot. They would have your hand put into a vat of boiling water or oil or sometimes make you walk across hot coals. And you can only imagine how creative people were getting back then, right? You never want another rest. Can't even say what happened on YouTube. Use your imagination. Hit that thumbs up and use your imagination. Number six, piece by piece. Okay, what's worse than ordeal by fire? Well, probably amputation. I'd have to go with the latter for sure. That's, it's close, definitely. In Viking societies, punishment was often dependent on status. The higher your status, the harder and longer your punishment was. High status folks got some pretty horrible stuff happening to them, honestly. If a thrall carried out a robbery at their master's command, well, then it was the master that was punished. So instead of a quick death, they would amputate something. It's horrible. Yeah, continue being a royal, but now your life is going to be much harder. A real life example of such was not the Danish king of England back from 1016 to 1035. Now the king put in place a horribly grim law that thankfully died with him, but it stipulated back then that a woman committing adultery must lose her nose and ears while men were merely chastised. Not even close to being fair at all. Now a thrall who would kill their master back then and then tried to run away were to have their arms and legs amputated afterwards. They weren't executed per se, but they could barely survive afterwards. I think I'd rather die at that point. That sounds terrible. Number five, tarring and feathering. Okay, we've all heard about this one. It's brutal, of course, but the most shocking part is how many steps this one involves. You know what I mean? Like you'd think at the feather part, one guy would be plucking like, what are we doing? This is insane. I have to go home. This is, it's been hours here. This is horrible. This one goes as far back as 832 AD. This disgusting act has been going down for quite a while. Again, it's so many steps. This is horrible. Who invented this? A man stealing on trade journeys was to be tarred and feathered. This was for stealing during journeys. Again, this is what I'm saying about steps here. First, you'd have to shave this Viking's head, which I don't know if you've seen a Viking recently, but that's gonna take a minute. A lot of hair, sure. Then said Viking was covered in tar and then duck feathers chucked on top. Then as if it couldn't get much worse, this poor guy covered in feathers and tar was forced to run between two lines of the men that he lived with and stole from. Now at that point, these other guys would throw stones, bricks, anything painful, you name it. Now anybody caught not throwing an object at the feathery fellow was liable to be fine. So I know it sucks, but grab something and grab it quick. If the thief did make it through this line alive, again, after being tarred and feathered, then he was off the hook from there on out. Then he was, I guess, innocent. I don't know. That's horrible. I, I wouldn't make that. No way. Number four, trial by ordeal. Quite the ordeal indeed. Look, I mentioned ordeal by fire earlier and that's quite a hot mess, but trial by ordeal is I have no words. Humans are so stupid, honestly. Introduced after Christianity, wild. Trial by ordeal was used as a test to determine whether someone was innocent or guilty. And yeah, spoiler alert, it was in fact not foolproof at all. In fact, it made absolutely zero sense at all. Basically, the accused would be placed into the center of everybody, and then they would have severe pain inflicted upon them in a multitude of ways. Like, they all just beat this person up. It was horrible, to say the least. If they survived all this pain, they were innocent. And if they didn't, then they were guilty. Who thought, like, who wrote the rule book on this? That doesn't make any sense. What kind of insanity is going on here? But wait, it gets even better. If their wounds were clean and without infection after three days, then they would be found innocent because it was a sign that the gods had intervened to show their innocence. So yeah, a lot of steps to be proven innocent. And healing apparently is one of them. Who knew? Number three, no insults. Yeah, the YouTube comments section could take a, a note from this one. Here we go. No insults. Be nice. This one's pretty good. This would change the game today. If you hurled insults at somebody back in the Viking age, well, they were entitled to compensation. And they could summon everybody else who's around at the time to be a witness. Yeah, they could be like, hey, you hurt my feelings. Give me $10. I guess that is happening today, but on a much larger scale. Comedians, really. If you spoke bad about somebody during the Viking age, even if the person wasn't there, it could ruin their reputation, right? And because of that, you need to pay them for the possible damages. Again, we see this happen today in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't even matter if the insult was true either. It's, it's too late, right? You spoke it, now it's out there. You did it. Your reputation was how you gained employment, met friends. It was a really important thing back then, more important than now. Can't be messed with, especially if you're a Viking. Yeah, no way. Also, if you insulted one man, you insulted his entire family as well. You know, the whole Viking rule. There were some words, however, where a man would be allowed to kill you if you said them to him. So yeah, choose wisely, I guess, with your insults. Number two, rap battles. Before we get to our big bad number one spot on today's list, we have to mention the best part of Viking tradition, in my humble opinion. Battles, but with words. 
Not with our fists, with our emotions. Fighting, or rap battles, or my favorite part of history, I would have killed it, honestly. I was writing some before lunch and I think I'm okay. During those days, you needed ways to pass time, right? If you couldn't play hockey and there weren't any villages to destroy, what does a Viking do? Why, you have loud poetry, that's what you do. Flighting comes from the old Norse flyta, meaning provocation. It's basically insult exchange, but make it theater. Now it's just... ASAP Rocky. North literature really has tales of their gods flighting. Imagine that. Imagine how cool that would be. Imagine the next season of Loki and he's battling Freya in some sort of rap circle, some cipher. That'd be amazing. The whole purpose here was not to see who could diss the other's hometown the hardest, but rather this was a challenge in order to see who can spontaneously think of a poetic retort. It's all brains and no brawn. A little different than traditional Viking battles, right? In Anglo-Saxon England, flighting would go down during a great feast. Imagine that. You'd enjoy a roast while watching a roast in real life. Double the roast, double the fun. Later, this was of course entertainment in the 15th and 16th centuries in Scotland. But don't get it twisted, Viking flighting got pretty intense. And finally, number one, the blood eagle. The best slash worst for last. Here we go. This was a ritual method of execution that was detailed in late skaldic poetry. Again, if you're eating food right now, maybe give it a break for a minute. I don't know, giving you a heads up. In the two instances where this horrible punishment was mentioned, the victims, historically, who both happened to be members of the royal family, they were both in the prone position, right? So they would lie flat on their tummies, then they would have their ribs severed from their spine using a sharp tool, then they had their lungs pulled out through the opening to create the sort of like, um, what do you, wings, I guess. Just like a nice lungy pair of wings. We love a creative Viking, I guess. Now, both instances where this insane punishment is said to have went down, historically, both of them were accused of killing their own fathers, so. I don't know what was going on back then or who's doing what, but we've got some daddy issues that are not being handled well at all. So don't do that, I guess. Don't do any part of that at any time. Again, how many steps goes into lunging somebody? I can barely carve a pumpkin in one go. You know what I mean? My wrist gets tired. I can't do that. That's a lot of work. Starting off this list, in our number 10 spot, we have scaphism. All right, you guys, this one is also known as the boats or being eaten alive. And really, whatever way you swing it, it absolutely sucks so badly. This is an ancient method of execution that involved putting someone sandwiched between two boats stacked on top of one another. From here, they'll feed the person and cover them in milk and honey, and then they just leave them. From here, the substance is on and in the person will fester and attract bugs and other small vermin, which will then basically eat that person who can't fend for themselves alive. Not only would being eaten alive be one of the worst ways to go, but this process was incredibly lengthy and ensured the person suffered for a really long time. Like, we're talking over 10 days here. In one of the first written mentions of scaphism, which comes from Plutarch in the life of Artaxerxes, while talking about the execution of Mithridates, he said, quote, when the man is manifestly dead, the uppermost boat being taken off, they find his flesh devoured and swarms of such noisome creatures preying upon and, as it were, growing to his inwards. In this way, Mithridates, after suffering for 17 days, at last expired. So, uh, yeah, anyway, if Plutarch Tark wants to go pay for my therapy after that, I'd be really grateful. In our number nine spot today, we have drawn and quartered. This was a popular form of punishment and became the statutory penalty for men who were convicted of high treason in the Kingdom of England from 1352, although this form of punishment certainly existed well before that. Basically, whoever the convicted was, they would be secured to some sort of wooden panel and then drawn by horse to wherever this whole thing was going down. That wasn't said casually to make light of this horrible punishment. I'm just uncomfy, so I'm trying to keep it cool and casual. So once at the place of execution, the person would then be hanged, almost to the point of them losing their life, but from there, they would then be emasculated, for lack of a better term, disemboweled, beheaded, and then quartered, or chopped into four pieces. All right. And because this simply wasn't enough for some insane reason, the pieces would then be displayed in prominent places across the country. Like, no, I do not want to see someone's upper right quadrant while going for breakfast. I'll pass on that. Thank you so much though. In our number eight spot today, we have Mazatello. This one was a method of capital punishment that was occasionally used by the papal states for only some of the most terrible crimes or crimes that were considered especially loathsome. Basically, the person who was being executed would be led to a scaffold that was located in the public square because they didn't have Netflix back then. So instead, they just watched people die. I don't know. It was weird. All 
I'll keep watching Ginny and Georgia instead. But anyway, the person would be accompanied by a priest, and on this scaffold would lie a coffin and a masked executioner who was dressed in black. A prayer would be said for the soul of the condemned, and then when the time came, the executioner would swing a mallet into the air and then bring it down on the head of the prisoner. Sometimes this one blow would be enough to take their lives, and sometimes it would merely render them unconscious, which would then lead to their throat being cut. None of this sounds good. This one sucks so bad. I feel bad giving you guys this information. Next video, can it be like top 10 nice, cool, wonderful flowers or something instead? Top 10 dogs. Let's do that. In our number 7 spot today, we have the Blood Eagle. This messed up thing was a ritual method of execution that was detailed in late skaldic poetry. In the two instances where this horrible punishment was mentioned, the victims, who both happened to be members of the royal family, were placed in the prone position. They were laying flat on their tummies, they had their ribs severed from their spine using a sharp tool, and then they had their lungs pulled out through the opening to create a sort of super messed up and really scary and terrifying pair of wings. Both instances where this insane punishment is said to have happened, the person was being punished for patricide or for killing their own father. So I guess definitely don't do that. I'm not really sure what the takeaway from this one is other than, wow, that sounds horrible and I'm really glad we don't do that anymore. I also really love my dad. In our number six spot today, we have keel hauling. This is a word that I wish I could erase from my vocabulary as it has to do with one of the most terrible punishments I've ever heard of. But I mean, I guess we've already talked about a bunch of these, so I should be used to it by now. The word for this punishment comes from the Dutch word keelhalen, which apparently means to drag along the keel, and that is exactly what this terrible method was all about. This punishment was usually reserved for sailors, and they would be stripped, tied, and suspended by rope from the mast of the ship with weights tied to their legs. The rope would be looped beneath the ship so that once the tied up sailor is released, they'd be dragged under the keel of the ship. In the world of the most unsurprising news ever, this method had basically a 100% fatality rate. Wow, it's almost as if you put someone in that situation that threatens their life in multiple ways, they just might not survive. How strange. In our number five spot today, we have the ducking stools. This was a punishment used in the 16th and 17th century England in New England, and it was usually a punishment that was reserved for women. This punishment was given to a woman for doing what was considered unwomanly, whatever that is supposed to mean. Apparently, this included things like having an argument with their husband, fighting with the neighbors, gossiping, and backstabbing. Whoever made these rules had clearly never met a man because, newsflash, everyone does literally all of those things. But hey, clearly the logic used in the past was not logical. Basically, this punishment would see a woman being tied up to a stool and then dropped into a lake or stream over and over again. This was actually a punishment method that didn't usually end up in death, but that sounds like the worst consolation prize of all time. In our number four spot today, we have trial by ordeal. This one is aptly named because it really was a whole entire ordeal and one that I'm sure absolutely none of us would have liked to have been a part of. This foolproof ancient judicial practice was used as a test to determine whether someone was innocent or guilty. Spoiler alert, it was in fact not foolproof at all. In fact, it makes absolutely zero sense. Basically, the accused would be placed in the center of everyone and they would have severe pain inflicted upon them in a multitude of ways. If they survived the pain, they were innocent, and if they didn't, they were guilty. Like, what kind of insanity is that? Apparently, there were a multitude of different ordeals people could be subjected to, like cold water, hot water, hot iron, really whatever option, they were all bad. What an insane idea to test someone's innocence. I'm just saying. I know a lie detector test is only 80 to 90% accurate, but I'll take that over this ordeal. In our number three spot today, we have death by elephants. There's a lot of messed up punishments we've talked about, but this one makes me extra angry because why do we need to include poor innocent animals in our terrible behavior? You know what I mean? Execution by elephant was quite a popular method of capital punishment in certain parts of the world. The elephants would be used to crush, dismember, or just inflict pain on captives who were being publicly executed. This method was most commonly used by royalty because it was a way they could use the elephants to signify both the ruler's power as well as their ability to control a wild animal. This practice began to die out in the 18th and 19th century as the parts of the world that used this method began to be colonized. Elephants were the chosen animal in part because of their size and strength, but also because of their intelligence, domestic ability, and versatility. Although bears and lions were more popular 
similarly used in other parts of the world, elephants had the ability to be trained to execute the person in a variety of different ways because they are so smart. I feel bad for the people who died like this, but I also feel really bad for the elephants who were forced to take part as well. In our number 2 spot today, we have the breaking wheel. Alright folks, buckle up for this one that was once used as a method of capital punishment. This method was most commonly used in Europe from antiquity through the Middle Ages and into the early modern period. This was a super simple device and it really was just a wheel, but it was absolutely terrible. There are two different methods with the breaking wheel. Either the person would be broken on the wheel or by the wheel. So basically, excuse the gruesome descriptions, but if you were broken by the wheel, basically you'd be placed belly down on a board and then the wheel was slammed down twice on each arm and leg and then on the spine. You'd then be tied to the wheel and hammered to a pole. The pole would be put up for the victim to be left up there to die. Yeah. I know I said it was gruesome and we still have another one to get through. Being broken on the wheel involved the limbs of the victim being tied to the wheel and then smashed with a club and in some places the wheel would spin just to add a little extra terribleness. The number and the sequence in which the smashes were distributed were not random however as they were actually determined in a court sentencing. Alright, let's keep going, we're almost done. In our number one spot today we have rats. Man, this one really sums up how terrible human beings can be. Rat torture originally Originated in ancient Rome, and ever since then, it unfortunately has been a part of the most horrible, gruesome punishments. What was once called a rat trap involved a man being tied down to something, and then a metal enclosure being strapped to his abdomen or chest. Inside this enclosure, there were rats, which the strapped down person can feel walking around, and this is when the person instilling the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure. Historically, hot coals were usually placed on top, which of course very quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside. From here, the rats begin frantically searching for a way out because, just like us, they have survival instincts. The metal enclosure is too hard to bite into, but a human's flesh is not. Well, you see where this is going. I don't need to say more, but just know that it is very, very painful and very, very horrible. And to make matters worse, this is only one of the terrible rat punishments there have been throughout history. So maybe if there's a part two of this video, we'll talk about another one. How fun would that be? Punishment number 10 is Ash Bath. Just saying medieval times doesn't actually mean much. Every empire and kingdom had its own respective medieval time at different times than one another. So Persia spanned from the 6th century to the 15th century, during which time they concocted some truly heinous punishments for those who did wrong, or at least those who did wrong in the eyes of whatever crazed leader was in charge at the time. Setting the stage for long suffering death everywhere, Persia introduced such styles as forcing people to drink molten gold, tearing people apart with trees, and drowning them in ash. This punishment was one of the worst deaths you could receive, reserved for the worst criminals and those guilty of high treason or offenses against the gods, and it was horrifying. It consisted of throwing a victim into a 75 foot tower filled with ash. You'd break a couple of bones, but it was a soft landing. From outside the tower, large hand cranks were spun by a team of men, sending the ashes flying and disrupting the solid pile so that the victim was pushed deeper and deeper down the tower, suffocating on burnt ash until they drowned in it. If you've dipped your toes in the Bible, you may know there's quite a few people that got this sentence in there, such as a corrupt Jewish priest whose family isn't allowed to bury his remains with a bunch of sassy snaps added. However, the concubines caught planning coups against their leader on several occasions met this fate too. Punishment number 9 is the evil field. So medieval Rome is characterized by the break with Constantinople and the formation of the Papal State, with technically ongoing until its collapse, which marks the beginning of Europe's medieval period. On the topic of being buried while still breathing, the Romans also enjoyed dumping people into holes alive in their medieval times. One famous example is the Vestal Virgins, the priestesses of the hearth goddess Vesta who were sworn to chastity. However, should they break that chastity vow? they had a special acre of grass dedicated just to burying them alive. Like most deaths, Romans like to make a big show of it, and the Vestal breaking her virginity vow would naturally be the Sunday matinee. They had an entire little ritual. She'd be carried on a litter throughout the city in the nude until they reached the Campus Seclaratus, aka the Evil Field. There, an underground chamber awaited in which she'd be lowered into and sealed inside alive. There was only one ever known instance in Roman history where a Vestal virgin wasn't slain for breaking her vows. That would be Julia. 
Julia Achilles Severa, the wife, then ex-wife, then wife again, of Emperor Elagabalus. It's believed that Julia reigned with him until they were killed in the year 222, but who's to say they put Julia in the ground after? Punishment number eight is the finger cinch. China's medieval period was between the fall of the Han Dynasty in 220 CE and the fall of the Mongol Dynasty in 1368 CE. Famous in the Chinese feudal dynasty, this form of punishment was specifically made for the woman who did not obey her master's command. Master can be taken literally, should it be a concubine or a servant, but also figuratively like her parents or husband. The offenders have to put their fingers inside a specialized tool which look like interlocking combs. The device would then squeeze the fingertips, causing immense pain and loss of circulation. If the victim faints, ice water would be thrown on her as a wake-up call. The punishment would continue until the victim was deprived of all their strength. The device was prepared in every shape and size to crush the fingers of any female, so she may ultimately surrender to male prejudice. Punishment number seven is the four witnesses. The Ottoman Empire was born very, very shortly, around 100 years at most, before the European medieval period started. As stated, it began when Rome broke from Constantinople, and thus it finished alongside the other European nations in the 16th century. How they punish adultery is akin to many cultures. Man cheats, no punishment. Woman cheats, world must be ending. The Ottoman criminal code did not distinguish between fornication and adultery. Xena was the word used for both, and both were unacceptable from a woman of any kind. And when caught in an alleged act of Xena, in order to ensure the women were not wrongfully accused, the accusers required to produce four witnesses of good standing that actually observed the act of intercourse as it was happening. Imagine that. You walk in on your wife in bed with your best friend. So you have to run yelling into the streets for four people to come right now and see them while they're still hurriedly dressing so you have some chance of getting her punished. However, even if you do manage to pull off four witnesses, if the witnesses can't be found at the time of the woman's trial, then the accusing husband will be flogged 80 stripes and ignored. So what I'm hearing is as a cheating wife, you could essentially make the little problem go away if these four witnesses were to, I don't know, just casually disappear before the court date. However, on a terrifying note, the husband's second option when calling the four witnesses to his house is taking justice into his own hands. He can actually just kill his wife on the spot and face no punishment nor require going to court, even if the witnesses didn't see the wife cheating beforehand. Punishment number six is marks and tattoos. European medieval period started with the fall of Rome in 476 AD and extended to roughly 1450. Meanwhile, a fun fact, the America's never experienced a medieval period because a feudal system was never actually established in that hemisphere. In Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter, protagonist Hester Prynne is marked with a red A to see her as an adulterer. This was practiced in a few regions of medieval Europe, such as Spain, France, even Britain. However, it was reserved for working girls and their keepers and continued well out of the medieval period until the Achaean regime. Women who committed the crime of Puritanism were branded with hot iron to show the world World, how frivolous they are. What The working girls received a P on the arm, the booty, or the forehead, which I feel is a bit vindictive and personal. Meanwhile, the keepers were branded with an M, accompanied by a fleur-de-lis. King Charles IV even made them outlaws, stating that may all girls of joy and public women desolate from our court in said time under pain of whip and mark. After the establishment of the new world, which is out of the medieval period, but as stated, the Americas didn't have one, we see branding laws and colonies more akin to Hawthorne's Scarlet Letter. So such as the 1658 Plymouth Law that stated adulterers must mark every garment they own to identify them of their crime. Adulterers seen publicly without their letters were subjected to public whipping and further humiliation. Punishment number five is just gross. The medieval and feudal periods of Japan, they hold hands on this one, stretched from 1185 to 1603 CE and they easily had one of the most disgusting punishments I've heard of for female adultery, suspected or confirmed. It existed from the 12th to the 9th century Japan, however it was more so practiced in remote villages. A wife accused of adultery was punished by a defacing, and this defacing was done by seed. Exactly the type of seed you're thinking. So I'm going to be talking around the subject due to a graphic nature. If a husband suspected that his wife had been unfaithful, he and his friends would take her to a remote area where she'd be restrained and the men would take turns standing above her and deface her. When the adultery isn't suspected but actually caught and confirmed, the adulteress would be led through the village naked before tied up in the center on her knees. Paper screens would be set up around her so that the men in the village who were urged to participate in this horrific act of public shaming may have privacy while they 
deface her. The screens only protected the men from indecency, the adulteress would remain exposed for the public to see what was happening to her. Punishment number four is Working Girl. Hard to follow up that last one with anything worse or more gross, but the medieval Japan had an eye for an eye judicial system that balanced crime and punishment. Japan had no gender bias and crimes done by women were not punished lightly, the way counterparts in Europe or China would have. Equal punishments were imposed for the same crime no matter the gender. So it's a bit strange that arsonists would be burnt at the stake, thieves have their hands cut off, liars lost their tongues and ears, but women committed a petty crime and was sentenced to work time duration as a working girl, which arguably is not even close to payment in kind. Additionally, a woman could have her head shaved as punishment for her crime. In larger empires, this was often the punishment for adultery, which is far better off than the one in the villages. The husband would also be granted an automatic divorce from his now bald and weepy ex-wife. Since punishment was equal, a man got his head shaved too, had to repay dowry, and get publicly shamed, right? No, and his wife wasn't allowed to leave him for it either. Punishment number three is scoffism. Back in the medieval Persia, this punishment was death by being eaten alive. It had taken place in a swamp or somewhere where the boat, which would be two canoe-like boats or one hollowed out tree, could lie exposed to the sun. The victim would be tied inside the space with their head, hands, and feet exposed if possible. At which point, the victim is force-fed honey and milk. This is a messy process. It'll splatter and spill everywhere. However, whatever the victim does swallow, inevitably becomes diarrhea. The idea was that this would attract every insect, vermin, and wild animal in the area. Very soon afterwards, flies and rats, for instance, would show up and start attacking the victim, eating the mixture of milk and honey, but also eating the person alive in the process. Once the diarrhea kicks in, it attracts other animals, especially the rats, who will begin feasting on you as well and sometimes enter you. Death usually came from septic shock or gangrene because the victim would be force-fed this honey and milk every day until they died, meaning dehydration was no issue. Religious fallacy, coup attempts, and adultery were all punished in this horrific manner, and many women suffered this end. Punishment number two is wooden horse. This device was used in Europe and Japan in the 14th to 18th centuries, making it predominant in medieval Europe. Initially, the horse was used on women accused of heresy and witchcraft. The Spanish particularly loved this crude device, and they invented it. Sometimes they even styled it to look like a horse. Its back was a triangular wedge women were forced to sit on as weights around their ankles dragged them and and their rear and hoo-ha area down on the sharpened wedge. It was covered in part one of this video. In Japan, however, they added another particularly horrific element that was not meant to just cause some external tears and pelvic fractures the way the Europeans did, rather cause mass hemorrhaging and death. The concept is the same, wooden horse with a wedge that you'd be forced to straddle while your legs are pulled down. However, the Japanese added an appendage-like structure on the horse's back, which the woman was forced to sit on. The appendage had the appendage was studded with iron nails and could be rotated via a hand crank from beneath. Naturally, this would cause almost immediate heavy bleeding and internal damage before the crank was even turned. Many would die miserably and quickly, whereas the ones who somehow survived often only did with paralysis. This form of punishment was served on basic offenses, such as adultery or unpleasing her husband. Punishment number one is the chest tax. Imagine taxing someone for what's on their chest. Now imagine taxing someone for what's on their chest and for them trying to cover it. Over in India, this was a reality imposed by the king of the erstwhile state of Travancore, one of the 550 princely states that existed in British ruled India. The chest tax was imposed on lower class women if they covered their chest in public and it was to discourage them from doing so. The purpose of this tax was to maintain caste structure, said Dr. Shiva KM, an associate professor of gender ecology. Social customs on clothing were tailored to a person's caste status, which meant that they could be identified by merely how they dressed. The village legend of Nangali is about a woman who supposedly cut off her girls in an effort to protest against the caste-based chest tax. Nangali belonged to the Abhava caste. Her community was required to pay the tax alongside many other lower castes, but villagers say she decided to protest by covering her chest without paying the chest tax. When the tax inspector heard she was refusing to pay the tax, he went to her house to ask her to stop breaking the law. She still refused and instead cut her girls off her chest in protest instead and presented them to the tax collector in a plantain leaf. According to the local villagers, Nangali died of excessive blood loss while her distraught husband took his life by jumping on her funeral pyre. Her act was selfless and a sacrifice that benefited all the women of Travancore, and ultimately forced the king to roll back the chest tax. The chest tax caught wider attention in 2016 when BBC reported Divya Arya reported on a series of paintings by artist Morali T, a far distant relative 
on the legend of Nangali. He was so moved by the story and the absence of any visual documentation, he decided to paint a likeness of the act she brought upon herself. I did not want it to depict it as a bloody event. Instead, my aim was to glorify her act as an inspiration to humanity, a representation of what would command respect. Such as the first one to make me puke, number 10, denailing. It's one of those torment styles I feel needs no explanation. The name kind of says it all, but to include you in the horror, the definition of denailing is the forcible extraction of fingernails or toenails or both. And man, was it a favorite method of the medieval times. And a fun fact I learned, the term cutting it to the quick actually originates with this horrible punishment. The quick is the nickname for the fingernail skin, AKA hypocachium. So when you're cutting it to the quick, you're digging up someone's fingernails. In its simplest form, denailing was done by first constraining the prisoner on whatever tabletop or chair, whatever you got ready to tie a person to. Then metal forceps or pliers, often heated over fire until red hot, grasp each nail at its edge and tear it from its nail or toe bed. Okay, Ma, this right here is why I am okay with the fact you never broke my nail biting habit. Unfortunately for me, the other variant of this would have still worked because in version two, they wedged something under the nail first and then hit it inwards to separate the nail from its bed. This was a favored method of the medieval German witch hunters who would dip the wooden skewers in boiling sulfur before wedging them in, which would burn the incredibly sensitive flesh of the underside of the nail. When enough skewers have been driven home to ply each nail loose from the bed, only then is the nail torn from the root with a pair of pliers. Okay, one and done. Let's hit number nine, which is stocks. And just like the stock market, it's scary and confusing that people involved are sitting on their ass. Sorry, the joke was there, I had to go for it. So, stock is both physical torment and public humiliation, the best of both types of medieval punishments. Okay, so you know that thing where they bend you over and they put your head and your wrists in it like this, as seen in the beautiful period piece, Shrek? The stocks are similar, but for your feet. Difference is, is that a person is placed in the stocks sitting with their legs extended in front of them and their feet are locked into place. Sometimes their hands or their head might be chained for funsies too, but overall they're left lying on the ground or if they're lucky they have something under their butt. Stocks could be found in the most public places available, where a town crier would come out shaking that big ass bell and telling the board masses they could contribute to punishing offenders against the standard of conduct of the time, aka free for all. See this defenseless person literally lying on the ground having an existential crisis because all they did was have a pimple that looked kind of like a witch spot and now their feet are in a Lego block? Get some repressed unacknowledged feelings out. Feel free to berate, attack, spit, kick, urinate, defecate, or even violate the man or woman in their immovable state. This was super popular among civil authorities in medieval times and was at its peak use during the Elizabethan England and the Spanish conquistadors tormenting those in the new world who fought back against Christianization. It was not uncommon for people to be kept in stocks for several days to die of hypothermia or heat stroke. Number eight is the Catherine Wheel, which was named after St. Catherine of Alexandria, who wasn't ever actually killed on one of these, but the fictitious story stuck and so did the name. So medieval France and Germany love this bad boy, which was essentially a giant cartwheel put on a lazy Susan. Folks would be stretched out on it and then tied down, then quite literally became a wheel of fortune because ideally the dude wielding the massive hammer taking swings at you while you slowly spin in a circle gets dizzy and misses. More often than not though, folks ain't that lucky. This wheel would be spun nice and slow over the hours and the hammer wielder would break different limbs as they circled past him. Once all the limbs were reduced to spiky bone fragment skin slabs, oh, sorry, but the person was left on the wheel to die. It could take hours, even days before shock and dehydration did its course. If your offense was less severe or you could bribe someone or you were at least well liked, the first blow would be to the neck in hopes of smoking you quickly. Known as coup de AKA blows of mercy. Otherwise they went from the feet up baby and the number of sequences of blows are specified in the court sentence. How as a lady did you earn the Catherine's wheel? Cheating, witchcraft, treason. Next up for number seven is the piquette. The perfect device for your DIY executioner. All you need is a stake, a hole in the ground to stick it out of, some rope and a little bit of friendship. It was usually used as a military punishment. However, the piquette did make its rounds even ending up in a famous illustration of a woman being subjected to it during the French Revolution. All right, so what you need to pick up from your Hobby Lobby or your Michael's Craft Store is a stake. You're gonna stick one end of it in the ground and then the exposed end facing upwards. Make sure to grab a saw and sandpaper because you're gonna need that exposed end to be sharpened to a rounded point, not a pointy point. Now grab some rope and your malefactor who is typically a soldier who had disobeyed order or a woman accused of witchcraft or sleeping around. You're gonna use that rope to suspend them from the tree by this region of the thumb while the sole of their opposite bare foot was balanced on top of the 
stake. The point of the stake was sharp enough to jab into the arch uncomfortably, but not enough to pierce your foot. Want to get the pressure off? You have to regulate all your body weight into the thumb that's suspending you. And yes, you may be thinking, wouldn't that tear your thumb from its socket? Absolutely, which is why you'd shift your weight back onto the painful foot. Pretty ingenious methodology, if you ask me. Nobody died, but some people did lose thumbs. Better than your life, though. This is a classic mention on our channel. Number six is the shame masks. If they tried to use those on us today, I personally don't think it'd work. The way that pride and ego function in modern days is so different from olden times, but back then, I guess it must have been an efficient humiliation tactic for them to have so many of these horrible masks. That, or people really vibe with the Halloween vibe. These masks, as mentioned, are meant to humiliate, and I guess there's nothing more humiliating than being compared to a pig or a rooster. Two of their most common designs. Some would have a pig snout, bird beak, devil horns, donkey ears. Bells are sometimes attached to attract the attention to the wearer, or even whistles attached to the mouthpiece, so anytime they breathe, the stupid thing would make a sound like the Tin Man from Wizard of Oz was approaching. Although less vicious than many other torments, they could still be painful and distressing, especially if your sentence is a long one. The mask can make it difficult to eat, drink, sleep, and could attract violence from hostile people or lecherous men. They were used as punishments for various misdemeanors, but usually it was to shut a woman up. Literally. You scolded your husband. That's a serious sin that contravened the Bible's clear instructions for wives to remain subservient, little... Well, I was gonna say Barbie dolls, but maybe after the movie, it's Ken's. Number five is also used to shut wives and women up. It's the Shrews Fiddle and Fife. But I could be wrong. It could be pronounced Fife like the country or Thief like Thief. Cannot tell for the life of me. Anyways, you've heard the boring Shrews scold a hundred times. I'm here to bring you a new exciting product if you want to publicly shame some women, but also simultaneously make it look like they're starting medieval times most vibing jazz band. The Shrews Fiddle or Shame Fiddle was a wooden contraption shaped roughly like a fiddle, or a fife, or thief, or whatever it is, which is a type of flute that acted like a portable stalks for your fingers and your neck. The shame flute was specifically designed to punish those who made bad music. However, these shrews implements are titled after the ladies that were tossed in them constantly, people who spoke up to their husbands or argued with one another. The next four titles on this list, I'm not kidding, are all rippers of some kind. We're gonna start with number four, the chest ripper. If I instinctually put my hands on my chest while we're talking, you will understand why in a second. This was a device made specifically and only for women to destroy a very specific aspect of femininity and thus remove what the medieval people perceived to be her desirability. And man, did these dudes have a weird ass fixation on doing stuff to breasts. Burned, brand, carved, or simply amputated. This is called sensual torture, but swap the N and the S for the letter X. It extends back to the time of ancient Rome and likely long before then too, but worst of all was a device coined in medieval England known as the breast ripper, a metal claw that pierced the flesh of the breast of the victim who was tied down and then pulled away forcibly, shredding it to pieces. It was used as both a method of punishment to mark breasts of unmarried mothers and women convinced of heresy, adultery, and hosts of other crimes, but also for interrogation because nothing is gonna make someone confess to being a witch faster than a sociopath with a giant pair of tongs. Number three is a rear ripper. It's unlikely, but if there was anything worse than the breast ripper, it's probably the pair of anguish. Recognizable now from video games and movies and leather bedrooms with red latex accents, this pear-shaped device was one of the many horrific devices that made it to the modern world, but was reborn with better purposes. A few medical devices have taken a page out of its book, such as the dreaded ch ch thing they use at gynecology appointments, and some birthing and colonoscopy gear. So, the pear is made up of four leaves. These are joined at the hinge at the top and a key or a crank on one end. As you can see on screen, it's named accordingly. The pear was inserted into one of the three viable orifices, two if it's a dude, depending on the nature of the crime committed. The oral device was reserved for heretics, while the back door and the middle door pairs were used on, you could never guess. Witches, witchcraft, ooh. Man, medieval times must have looked like the set of Halloween Town, the way that witchcraft is constantly referenced. Anyways, turning the key open the leaves and every little click click of the key causes massive internal damage that was rarely fatal, but very thorough way to get a confession out of someone, or just about any I'm pretty sure the average person would admit to something as ludicrous as riding a magic donkey out of the king's palace if it meant that would stop. Number two is another rear ripper. Yeah, they liked those. Come to think of it, for such a sensually repressed society, they seem to get quite raunchy 
with their punishments. It's almost like that's the reason you shouldn't repress feelings like that. The Judas Cradle, also known as the Gilded Cradle, was a regular stool with a wooden or metal pyramid on the top. The victim would be stripped, tied with ropes on all four limbs, and then like some elaborate marble movie set up behind the scenes, they get lifted into the air and suspended just over top of the pyramid. Then their bits are adjusted to sit right on top of the pyramid. From here, the captive holder could torment them further, try to get confessions, whatever, before letting loose more and more of the person's own body weight, which would slowly impale them downwards on the pyramid, which in turn would start making room for itself. This punishment method was frequently used in the Inquisition, but I invite you to guess when else. Could it be A, witchcraft, uh, B, witchcraft, or C, witchcraft? If you guessed any of those three, you're right, because pretty much every medieval punishment for a woman was because she talked too much or made a soup that tasted too good, so the devil must have done it. All right, the last in our little ripping montage, number one is the rail rip, AKA a wooden horse, also known as riding the rail. It's an eft device of which there are two variations. The first is like a balance beam from gymnastics, but triangular, mounted on a sawhorse-like support. The victim is made to straddle the triangular horse and place their full body weight down on the hoo-ha area, which rested on the blunt point of the angle. Weights and additional restraints were added to keep the victim from falling off, but also to drag them down. Left for days, it can begin destroying your pelvis, as well as dislocate all of the joints in your legs. A less immediately painful variation is a single plank of wood supported, again, with the wooden legs or sometimes suspended from the ceiling, horizontal from the floor, on its side, with a thin edge and sharpened extremely. The victim is made to straddle the plank, which is adjusted to their height, so that they have to stand on their tiptoes or let their hoo-ha, meet a very serrated fate. This wasn't a witchcraft one, ironically, but rather for adulterers, working girls, or women who breathed a little too hard and their husbands wanted them gone. Number 10, trial by jury. The concept of trial by jury can be traced back to ancient Greece and Rome. Don't get me wrong, that's old school. But the first recorded use of a modern jury system, that dates back to the 12th century England. Medieval England, yes, let's get some men in a room and point at witches. Henry II introduced the practice to replace previous methods of trial, which at that point was relying on physical combat or divine intervention, all that kind of like that. Under this new system, a group of 12 men from the community would be chosen to hear evidence and determine the guilt or innocence of said accused. Right? A little better. A little, you know, less witchcraft, more, okay, we're all talking now. We're conversing. This system gradually spread throughout Europe and then beyond, so on and Danforth, and it became an important cornerstone of many modern legal systems. Back in the day, this was a noble deed. It was an honor to be part of the jury, you know? Today, not, not really so much. Not the same at all. You're like, what? No, I don't want to do that. It's going to take so long. It's going to be like four weeks of jury duty. I haven't done it yet. I've just jinxed myself. I'm going to get called any day now. Don't answer. You know what I mean? Just don't answer your mail. Don't look. Just avoid it. That's what I do. Number nine, the stocks. All right, relax, stock bros. I'm not talking about those stocks. I'm talking medieval stocks. Those ones are... A bit different. Those ones were very bad. Those are all bad. The stocks were a common form of punishment in medieval times. The convicted person's ankles were locked into these wooden boards with holes for their feet and stuff. And their hands were sometimes also restrained. We've seen this before. Usually people are like this. You go to a theme park, you pose with your family in one of these things. You're like, hey, I'm stuck. You're like, get me out, this is scary. They would be left in public spaces like that, such as the marketplace or town square, anywhere public because why, of course, you know, shame, shame. We got to shame everyone back then. And if that wasn't bad enough, the accused would then be pelted with food or even physically attacked by the crowd. Imagine that. Imagine being so sparse for food and you're like, yeah, let's throw our bread at that guy. It's like, what? what a waste. We need that. The duration of the punishment is varied, but it could range from a few hours to several days. Yeah, locked up like this for days at a time. What a joke. It was used for various crimes, theft, drunkenness, and slander. And it was intended to humiliate and shame the offender while also serving as a deterrent to others. Guys like, oh, I'd hate to be that guy over there. Yeah, for sure. All right, let's throw food at him now. Sick. So dumb. So dumb. Number eight, the drunkard's cloak. Yeah, this one's uh, quite funny. Not really, but we'll see. The drunkard's cloak, also known as the barrel or the shaming cloak. Again, shame, shame, big important step back there. This is a humiliating 
punishment used in medieval times for people who were drunk or disorderly in public. This person, this drunk person, they were forced to wear a large barrel or a cloak made of wood or heavy cloth, something big and obvious with holes cut out for their heads and arms. Like they're a big mascot, a big barrel mascot in medieval times. And sometimes they would have offensive messages or images painted on it. You know what I mean? Like the piece of paper that says, kick me. That was like the old school version of that, much worse. The person would then be paraded through town in this garment, this outfit, this big barrel and not fun, often with crowds throwing garbage or food at them. You know, that kind of medieval Game of Thrones stuff. This punishment was intended to publicly shame the person as well, so yeah. Shame, and then we'll go into the rough nitty gritty stuff at the end here. Number seven, eavesdropping. Eavesdropping back in the day. I mean, today we've all done it, right? We've all listened at some point in our lives to somebody we don't know. Every time I hear somebody in our hallway, in our apartment, I have to look, right? I'm like, who is it? Someone breaking in. But if you did it during the dark ages, if you listened in on a conversation you weren't supposed to hear, well, there were some serious consequences that were waiting for you. Eavesdropping was considered a serious crime back then. That's why they're always whispering in Game of Thrones. Now it makes sense, right? The act of secretly listening in on someone's conversation without their knowledge and or consent, while this crime was viewed as a breach of privacy and trust. <sighs> How dare thee? It was often associated with other crimes such as treason or espionage. This was a big bat. Espionage? Are you kidding? Just because you heard someone say something? Get out of here. Punishments here could include fines, public humiliation, classic, imprisonment, or... Yeah, remember what happened to Littlefinger in Game of Thrones? Not great. There's worse stuff that could be done. Yikes, horrible. Number six, Pacific hunting. Yeah, you gotta be sure which, uh, where you throw an arrow back then. In medieval England, the hunting of the king's deer was considered a very serious crime. Yeah, not that deer. That one's fine, but just don't you hit that one. Mm -mm. The act of killing or even injuring a deer was punished harshly under the royal forest law, which was enforced by the king's foresters. That'd be a cool job, just rolling through the forest looking for people. The law applied only to the king's forests, which were areas of land set aside specifically for hunting for his food. Violators could be subjected to a variety of punishments, including fines, imprisonments, and even mutilation. Yeah, a little different than public humiliation. It's just mutilation this time. This law was meant to preserve the deer population for the king's personal use and enjoyment, and served as a way for the monarchy to maintain control over the forest and the resources that it provided. So if you want food, go to that the forest over there. It's not even a forest, it's like a marsh. It's horrible. It's like three frogs left. Good luck. Number five, heretic's fork. Yeah, a lot like this. This one sucked. The medieval heretic's fork was a device used during the Inquisition to punish individuals accused of heresy. You hear the wrong stuff and then you say the wrong stuff. No matter what you do, bad punishment awaits. Some fork's going in a place you don't want it to be. This punishment consisted of a long metal fork with two prongs that were placed under the chin and the sternum of the accused, making it so you had to stay upright or else, yeah, not good. The device was designed to keep the person awake and prevent them from speaking and or swallowing, and if they do so, it would cause extreme pain. The prongs here could be adjusted to vary the amount of pressure applied, and the device was often left in place for hours or, again, like the other punishment, even days at a time, which is horrible. The heretic's fork was cruel and it was a form of psychological punishment that was used to extract confessions and punish those who dare to speak out against the church. Yes, how dare thee? Now hold still. Number four, sewer surfing. Uh, it's not as cool as you're imagining, but it's something along those lines. Also known as sewer hunting and or draining, sewer surfing was a popular but illegal activity during the dark ages and involved navigating through the underground sewage systems of cities, typically for thieves or other illicit activities, trying to find some gold, something, I don't know, something shady going on under the city. Sewer surfing was often punished severely, more than you'd think here. Guys going through garbage, they're like, ah, hang him. It's like, what? What? It was also considered a violation of the law and a danger to public health. You go down there, you come back up with, I don't know, a plague that you found down there? You don't want that. You don't want a rat to bite you. Offenders would face fines, imprisonment, or even the gallows. However, despite the risks and penalties, many people, many people, continued to participate in this dangerous activity as it was their only means of survival or adventure, or money or goods or anything really. It led to numerous arrests and punishments throughout the medieval period. Honestly, Fair. I don't know, you never know. Somebody may have lost a nice pocket watch or maybe you'll find rats and then get really sick. 50-50. I found a pocket watch and also the town is violently ill, so 
I'm rich, sorry. Number three, blasphemy. Blasphemy, you almost have to yell it every time you say it, you know? Blasphemy was considered a serious crime in medieval times. It involved speaking ill or speaking contemptuously about God, Jesus, and or the church. That's a big no-no back then, big no-no. This was seen as a direct attack, a direct attack to God and the faith. It was considered a threat to the very fabric of society just because you said some Blasphemers can be punished in various ways. At this point, you probably know them. Imprisonment, flogging, and or, well, yeah, just, you're dead now. In some cases, offenders were forced to wear a blasphemer's bridal, which was a metal mask with a spike that was inserted into the offender's mouth, which would, of course, prevent them from speaking more. Blasphemy laws varied across different regions and periods throughout medieval European history, but they all shared a common goal of protecting the sanity of religious beliefs and shoving metal into a human's mouth. All those things were very important to the faith. It's good stuff. Number two, beard tax. I tried to grow a beard for like two weeks and I just, I just immediately bailed on the whole thing. I was like, hey, you'll see me guys, I'll show you. And then I came back, didn't even talk about it. In medieval times, I would have been fine. Honestly, this is a, it's a weird tax. There were periods and regions in medieval history where facial hair was regulated and or frowned upon. Imagine that, right? Guys trying to grow it out, a little, has a little stubble. Everyone's like, ugh. Really, Alexander the Seventh? Really? During the reign of Henry the Eighth in England, a beard tax, a beard tax, cha-ching, was imposed to well, only men with beards over two weeks old. They were required to pay. If you were day 13, they're like, all right, we'll see you tomorrow. You better figure it out, figure this whole thing out, mister. Vikings, however, what about them? In the dark ages, Vikings, they were all about the beards. What happened? Beards, when it came to Vikings, they were highly valued and considered a sign of masculinity and strength. Again, I'd be screwed if it was that time. I'd be good over here, but then I'm a very weak man over here. Know what I mean? No tax and then no muscle. Taylor McWaters, no tax and no muscle. Huh. And finally, number one, not reporting a dead body. Yeah, we've all seen Stand By Me. This can lead to some problems, some troublesome things. This last one here is pretty obvious in theory, but the way that they handled it back then was pretty crazy. We're not doing it the same today. Thank God. Thank the church and the lords. In medieval times, roughly around 1240, the law surrounding the discovery of a dead body, ha, huh, surprise, what's this? Who is this? This varied depending on the region and the time period. But generally, if somebody discovered a Huh, who is this uh, skeleton? What's this? Generally, at that time, they required to report it to the courts or the lords. The lords, you know the lords. Go tell the lords. Failure to do so could result in punishment, as of course, it was considered suspicious behavior. Fair, okay, fair. More often than not, the person who found the body, they would be asked to provide information about the circumstances surrounding the death, including any and all possible suspects. Yeah, so, uh, Take a guess. He had wood teeth, he looked old and medieval. I don't know, he was someone. In some cases, the finder may have been entitled to a reward for discovering the body, but in other cases, you yourself could be charged with the death. So, 50-50, might get some money, might go to jail. If that was me, I'd be like, nope, I didn't see a thing, sir. I was just looking up at space, wondering what that big rock in the sky is. I don't know what gravity is. All women are witches, right, brother? Cheers, <laughs> didn't see anything. Number 10, Ray Romano. While listening to Ray Romano's voice for hours on end may be one of the harshest punishments ever conceived. Seriously, I wouldn't want to do that. What I was actually referring to was his portrayal of the woolly mammoth in Ice Age. Yes, the large tusk beast of the Forgotten Era. They were tough, and if Cross would surely spell the end of any Neanderthal brave enough to face one alone, which I'm sure at some point was. Cause trouble in the tribe? Well, then you have to bring us dinner, and we're hungry, so please go single-handedly and hunt and bring back a woolly mammoth. I couldn't even imagine. Unfortunately for those Neanderthals, this isn't Star Wars, and they weren't Boba Fett. Bringing back the head of a beast single-handed wasn't going to happen. They were most likely going to get trampled and left for archaeologists left to find thousands of years later. Yeah, no thanks. Number 9. Cliff While the Neanderthals might not have been as smart as their homo sapien counterparts, they were not exactly idiots. You find a high enough cliff, and you push said banished member off the cliff. It's simple but effective. There's a good chance that whomever gets pushed off, said Cliff, will not cause trouble for the tribe any longer. This is something that many civilizations would do for many years. The Greeks, the Romans, just about everyone really. You can't blame them either. It's cheap and quick. And if the cliff or ledge is high enough, you don't ever have to worry about cleaning up. Although I wouldn't do it in a pit like the Spartans. That would just fill up too quickly. And no shot that was the first time that Leonidas kicked a dude in the pit, let's be honest. Is there someone who empties the hole later? Cliffs are just easier, just, just easier. 
Number eight, ear infections. Okay, not exactly a punishment, but it could be a punishment from up above. Hear me out. Not exactly sure who did this to the Neanderthals. Maybe it was God, maybe it was evolution, maybe it was something else, but the Neanderthals were cursed with something that I don't ever want to experience again. Shout out to the people who don't want to put their head underwater because after about five hours, the bonfire on the beach isn't so fun with your friends because you have an ear infection. Yes, that's right, ear infections. I'm sure I just described someone's least favorite summer night. Well, according to a study in 2019, ear infections were common in Neanderthals and may have ruined many meals by the fireside. While humans like us eventually grow out of them due to our ears' insides growing larger as we grow older, the inside of Neanderthals' ears stayed small and were a perfect place for bacteria. And like most folks, you're not you when you're hungry. You're also not you if you can't hear the Arctic monkeys playing by the bonfire because of a really bad ear infection. Honestly, if you ever had one, I'm just sorry. Number seven. Stick. This should come as no surprise, but a lot of problems or punishments were probably dealt with in the almighty stick. Cheap, somewhat effective, and in good supply. There's tons of expression for who's got the bigger stick, but like General Shepard from Modern Warfare 2 said, it also depends on who's swinging it. We'll never really know who was the first human-like creature to pick up a stick and wave it, but what we do know is that sticks are a part of everyday life, like tools and hunting. The sticks can also make for an excellent punishment delivering device. Sticks and stones may break your bones, but names can never hurt me. Well, maybe sometimes. Honestly, the only time I've ever been really hurt is when the world lost Harambe. Rest in peace, you silverback angel. <sighs> Life's never been the same since. Number six, rock. And you smell what the rock is cooking. Man, I miss the old rock. I miss the WWE. Those were just good times, weren't they? Stone Cold too, what a great guy. Speaking of rocks. Probably the next best thing to a stick is a rock. Probably even cheaper and more plentiful than sticks. All kinds of punishments can be derived from rocks. Simple techniques such as having the tribe fill baskets full of rocks and then throw them at you until you're seeing stars or just ceasing to exist. Or in a similar situation, throwing someone off of a cliff, take a semi-large rock and drop it from a large height on top of somebody's head. Methods are different, however, it usually ends up in the same results. Just wait till they find out what kind of minerals and ores are hiding in those rocks. Oh, the discovery of metal and metalworking. Number five, good soup. Perhaps we'll never know where any of these punishments truly come from, but like all things, they had to come from somewhere. Maybe they did come from Neanderthals. What I'm talking about here is boiling people alive in oil. Ah, the good old days, which honestly sounds like the worst way to go. I, it just can't be nice. A practice that yet again was done all over. Giving people the lobster treatment must have been the worst looking, the worst sounding, and the worst smelling way to unalive someone. I happen to be a lover of theater, but man, this is a little too much. It's hard to call this anything but theatrics, as I'm sure there were much easier ways to achieve uh, certain goals. Honestly, you could probably cough on someone and would achieve the same result. Boy, am I thankful for sanitation. Number four, sacrifice. When your source of food gets taken away and then the rain doesn't stop for six days and six nights, and when your favorite VHS no longer works, it can truly only be an act of God. We have to please him, said a bunch of Ooga Booga men around the campfire. But how do we do this? Well, that's usually when the quiet person in the back speaks up. Sacrifice someone to the gods, he says. All right, sounds good to me. This was something that went on in many cultures around the world, but it makes you wonder who really was the first to try it, or rather keep trying it. I mean, hey, the buffalo came back, the rain stopped, and I just found my favorite VHS. Dude, we gotta sacrifice more people. Number three, the brazen bull. This might be the oldest punishment on the books. It also may be the worst. Seriously, this, this one's the worst. Similar to boiling in oil, however, this is just, just much worse. The brazen bull, basically what you got here is a bull made of bronze, and she's hollowed out like one of those walker things from Star Wars, all the little stormtroopers in it. So you put the perpetrators inside, you lock them in, and then you start a fire underneath that would essentially cook your perps to well done. Make sure your perps are well oiled and salted. Keep on high heat until the screaming stops or the desired sin has been cooked away. Yeah, I can't even begin to imagine the horrible feeling that would be locked inside there. No amount of aloe vera could ever fix those burns. Number two, dishonored burial. You are born, you live, and then you pass away. That's life. 
you gotta make the best of it. And at the very end, the least you can hope for is that the people will love you and give you the proper send off that you deserve. This was a serious deal for those in the olden times. Every culture from every corner of the world has some sort of burial and ritual rites. However, imagine if you were the tribe's disgrace. Perhaps you ate all their food or never contributed to the tribe. Maybe you're the reason why my favorite VHS tape went missing. Well, sir or madam, for your crimes and disrespect against this tribe, when you pass on, you will not receive the proper burial rites. There's been a few cases of remains dug up different from others, which begs the question, what did the person do to deserve such dishonors? And what did they do with my favorite VHS tape? Number one, banishment. Hello darkness, my old friend. In the same way that most teenagers across the country feel when they discover hair dye, punk rock, and feelings, is probably the same way Neanderthals feel when they were banished from their homes. A simple plan, really. Non-violent, but quite effective. As you walked along the boulevard of broken dreams, you'd be searching for a new home in the brutal, cold, and scary world that was ye olde times. Not even your offspring will know you, as you may never return. Besides, you're in too deep, and you're trying to keep yourself alive with anything that you can find. The all-American rejected teenagers do this kind of isolation from the comfort of their warm, isolated bedrooms that are paid for by loving parents. The Neanderthals were serious, as leaving the safety of your numbers had many disadvantages. Not being eaten by a predator, for one. Stay strong, kids. Stay strong. Number 10, the pillory. Known sometimes as the Thu, this was a form of stocks that was used for women. Men weren't the only ones who were condemned to the stocks back in the day. While on paper, standing around in the stocks for a few hours doesn't actually sound that bad. Like a bit humiliating and a bit exhausting because you gotta keep your arms up here. But you know, that's about it. In reality, it could actually be very dangerous, depending on the crowd's temperaments and the accused's reputation amongst the common folk that had gathered. In some cases, people were badly injured, maimed, blinded, and some actually died as a result of being tormented by those who gathered while they were in the stocks, after suffering great injuries. The unfortunate thing was that you often wouldn't be able to defend yourself because your hands are like restrained. You couldn't move your head and often your hands are just completely restricted depending on the type of stocks that you're being held in. At least with the Thu version, your hands were not restricted because you were like kind of in a collar on a chain, but women also were put in the pillory too, where your hands are restricted, preventing you from defending yourself at all from assailants unless you are being defended by like, I don't know, guards perhaps. Even then, you're probably still gonna be brutalized in some way. Guards aren't there to like, you know, make sure that you don't get to feel the punishment. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Bumblebee and you love when we tell you about some honestly very shocking things that happen in history, be sure to click that subscribe button for even more historical and horrific content. <laughs> Number nine, Drunkard's Cloak. While more popular in the 17th and 18th century, there is still documentation of the Drunkard's Cloak being used into the mid 19th century. It was a punishment given to both men and women, usually those who had you know, a bit too much to drink. However, the punishment was also administered to women who were considered to be promiscuous, like so many of the things that are on this list. If you were sentenced to the Drunkard's Cloak, you'd basically be made to walk around town in like an upside down down, heavy and cumbersome barrel with holes cut out for your head and your hands. Honestly, this is one of the least awful ones on the list. It's at least you're just in a barrel. <laughs> it doesn't sound like it would be fun, but it doesn't sound like it would be like the worst. I feel like I could walk around for a few hours with a barrel on and I'd be all right. Number eight, Shrew's Fiddle. I have a question. Why are there so many devices that were created in the Middle Ages hundreds of years ago that were still used up until the early 1800s and beyond? That seems insane to me. The Shrew's Fiddle is one of those instruments, but despite being named after a musical instrument, it is instead an instrument of torment. It was used to punish women who were deemed too shrewish and in some places in the world, it wasn't just used on women. The woman in question would be forced to put her neck through a large hole with her wrist being held in the smaller holes so her hands were basically up in front of her but were immobilized. Number seven, Scold's Bridle. Despite the fact that this device can be traced back to the 1500s, there are also records of it being used as late as the early 1800s into the 19th century, which is honestly crazy to me. Like I can't even imagine someone trying to silence me with this device today. Goodness, horrific and humiliating. The Scold's Bridle was used to silence women who were being too loud, either speaking their mind too much, being caught gossiping, or just literally, you know, being too loud. Pretty wild when you think the same society that decided this was a good punishment 
punishment is also kind of the same society that encouraged women to gossip by pitting them against one another and also, you know, silencing them. So that probably many women felt the only way they might be able to safely speak their minds about something was, you know, like whisper behind someone's back for fear of them hearing and what would happen then. But then of course, if you do get heard, this is what you get, because people are like, we don't want you to whisper, we just want you to shut up. Seems like a weird cycle though to me. It's like we created the problem and then we just basically punished people for the problem we created. The Scold's Bridal was a mask that women were forced to wear. Oftentimes it was made to look demonic or ugly in terms of the features on the mask, and it had a painful restricting metal gag inside that would literally hold down the wearer's tongue so they couldn't physically speak sounds terrible. Also then if you try to speak, it could like hurt your tongue, not, not good. Number six, left to cook. While sitting by the fireplace is usually seen as being a pleasant way to pass the time relaxing and soothing. In fact, I was just listening to some fireplace sounds while I was writing today. It becomes a lot less nice and tranquil if you are literally chained to the spot. While the scold's bridal is admittedly awful, it could actually get worse for women confined by the mask. In addition to that punishment, sometimes they would also be chained to the fireplace probably by their parents or guardian or their husband, whoever basically would have owned them at that time. Until such a time as it was deemed they had learned their lesson. I personally, I like to sit by the fireplace, but I like to do it by choice. Number five, walk of shame. Remember in Game of Thrones when Cersei Lannister was made to do like the walk of shame? Yeah. That is a real thing that happened to women in history. The Scold's Bridal was also sometimes made to be worn by women who were then paraded through the town and in said mask just to humiliate them further. And there's a few different things people would parade people in town with, but the mask is one of them. As, no, as if just being forced to wear that mask wasn't awful enough. I don't think you need to parade someone around or chain them to a fireplace. I think you can just like leave it at the mask, to be honest. Your point would be made. In fact, I don't even think you need the mask at all. Just don't try to make a point to begin with and then we're all good. How about instead we just let women exist and be heard? Hmm? Just a thought from a woman who's living in 2023, ye old past. Talking to you, past, back there. Yikes. Number four, hand clamps. Honestly, this sounds like one of the most horrific and worst things I've heard of. And it might not sound bad to people, but I don't know. I just imagined what this would be like, and I was like, that's horrifying. This method of torment was popular during the feudal period of China. It was used all the way up till the 19th century. What did it involve? Forcing women to put their hands into a tool that would then squeeze the tip of their finger. Doesn't sound that bad when you're thinking of it on like the surface level, but, and in terms of like the surface area of your finger, but this pain was actually so bad because of the pressure that it would cause many to just pass out. But once you passed out, they would just splash some cold water on you and force you to stay awake so you could experience every single second of pain awake. It wasn't reserved for just the hands or fingers either. There were also tools like this used to apply pressure to the feet and the head even of suspected offenders. Yeah, this method of course wasn't even safe for people who were convicted of adultery, which honestly, I don't even think you should torment people physically like this anyways, or mentally, even if they're guilty of it, like let's just be adults and move on. It was used on both guilty and innocent folks. I am sure, I am 100% positive. All you had to do was be suspected of adultery for this brutal form of punishment to be administered. So you don't even need any, I mean, back then, I don't even think people had proof. They were just like, I have a feeling, so do something terrible to this woman. Number three, ducking stool. Despite being more well known for its use during witch trials, the ducking stool was also something that was used to torment women in the 19th century as well. In fact, documentation of its use exists from as late as 1896. That seems pretty late to me. That's wild. Although I obviously wasn't alive at that time and it was over a hundred years ago now, it does not feel that long ago relative to our history and time spent on this earth. Oh boy. A ducking stool was basically a chair, a variation of another stool type used to humiliate people. However, in the case of the ducking stool, you were more than humiliated, you could actually die. Women would be tied to the ducking stool, basically a chair, and then lowered into the water. During the witch trials, this was one of the methods used to discern witches from innocent women. The problem being that witches would apparently survive the process thanks to their wily powers, whereas women would be proclaimed innocent if they could not float, swim, or survive this process. Meaning that many that were then deemed innocent wouldn't survive the ducking process. So it seems like a flawed way to test that. You know what I mean? Like if someone's innocent, I feel like they shouldn't end up dead, but I don't know. 
Only the witches get to live, and even then they don't get to live. No one gets to live. Are you a woman? No life for you, sorry. You just gotta move on. That's history for you. Number two, foot binding. While not a punishment for any misdeed, foot binding was a cultural practice that has often been tied to sexist ideals for women that were created not necessarily by them, but by like society at large. The idea with foot binding was to break the bones of young girls' feet so that their feet could be shaped into a small and dainty size. From a young age, their feet were broken, bound, and conditioned so that they would be and remain small into adulthood. Well, no longer something practiced today, foot binding is an ancient practice that is believed to have originated somewhere around the 10th century. The decline began though around the mid 19th century. That's nine centuries of foot binding after questions were raised about the practice in the 18th century. Number one, nose cutting. Probably one of the most brutal punishments out there for suspected adultery or promiscuity is the method of nose and ear cutting. This is when women have their noses and or their ears removed. This is done to disfigure the woman and take away the power of her beauty as punishment for whatever misdeed she's accused of. In many cases, women have been punished in this way without even actually being proven to have done anything that is even deemed wrong by whatever moral code you're subscribing to by whatever whack moral code you are subscribing to. Some women have even been punished this way simply for defending or protecting themselves or others. Typically, nose cutting is reserved as a punishment for women. It happened not just in the 19th century, but before and even after that as well.